Well, welcome to the Tongues Workshop. Mm. So we're, we are doing number two in a series on the corporate expressions of tongues. So these are the functions and the purposes of tongues in the assembly of believers. Uh, so we're going to be covering basically corporate praise in tongues, corporate prophecy in tongues, and corporate singing in tongues in this workshop. So there are at least two accounts in scripture where there is an assembly of believers and they're speaking in tongues as a group in unison and there is no formal interpretation given. And one of them, of course, is at Pentecost. This is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the believers. Hey, Edwina, come on in. I always get an And the other is in the home of Cornelius, the Roman centurion. This is when the Gentiles get converted to Christ. These are the first Gentiles. So we're going to go through both of those accounts, their landmark accounts. But let's talk about Pentecost first. So over 3,000 people rushed to the scene of the heavenly commotion. This is when the disciples spoke in other languages. And this was their report. We hear them, the disciples, speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So that's in Acts chapter 2, verse 11. And that word wonderful, of course, celebrates what is wondrous. It expresses praise. It highlights the human response to God's mighty works or deeds of power. Uh, the awe and the gratitude of those who witness those mighty works. So one of the functions of corporate tongues is praise. And another function is prophecy. And we learn this from Peter, who explains the phenomenon of the outpouring of the Spirit as prophecy. He identifies it as the fulfillment of a prophecy in the book of Joel. And uh, he reads, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. So he interprets the corporate tongues as prophecy. This is in Acts chapter 2, verse 18. So corporate tongues bear attributes of both praise and prophecy, right? The tongues laud God, but they also foretell the future, and they foretell the future. They release creative power. They set in motion God's plans. They proclaim what will be, and they make that manifest. Now, this is interesting, but a lot of contemporary Christians would say that the corporate praise and prophecy that was released at Pentecost was um, valid simply because the bystanders happened to understand the languages spoken, right? Have you heard that? Um, so they're basically claiming that the validity of corporate tongues depends on human understanding. And that is actually wrong. Uh, corporate praise and prophecy is valid because God gives the message, not because human beings understand the message, right? Whatever God does is valid, whether or not people understand what's going on. So let's take a hypothetical scenario for a moment. Imagine that those bystanders did not understand the languages spoken. Suppose they had not understood. Would, that, would their lack of understanding have invalidated the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and negated all of those messages that were released? No. That's a rhetorical question. No. And the answer is no. 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 <laughs> right? Uh, so basically the messages are valid apart from human understanding. Um, you have to think even, you know, the disciples didn't know what they were saying yet God used them to deliver those messages. So the validity of prophecy is really not dependent on the understanding of the speaker or even the listener. This may sound a little bit outrageous, but we're gonna consider a very thought-provoking example of this principle that ignorance of a prophetic message does not invalidate the prophetic message. Do you remember when the high priest Caiaphas advised the Jewish council to have Jesus executed by the Romans so that they would not lose their religious or political status to Jesus, right? He was basically conspiring with the council to arrange for the death of a religious and political rival. And this is how the Jewish council understood him. And this is how the priest understood himself. 
but he was actually occupying a divine office. He was high priest. So he was not just scheming and plotting, he was actually prophesying as a high priest, and he didn't know it, and neither did the council. He wasn't just advising the execution of a political rival, he was actually um, prophesying God's redemptive plan for humanity, right? That Jesus would die a sacrificial, atoning death for the Jews and also for the Gentiles. Now, such a suggestion would have been deeply abhorrent to them, right? So, Caiaphas, the high priest, didn't understand his own prophecy, and neither did the audience, the, the Jewish council. Neither the prophet nor the audience of the prophecy understood that message, and yet it was still valid and effective, right? Let me read this to you. This is actually reported in John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So the point here is that prophecy does not have to be understood by either the speaker or the listeners to be valid. And corporate tongues, which are a form of prophecy, are valid apart from a comprehending audience. That's the, that's the point that we're getting to. So let's explore this a little bit further. Let's take another hypothetical scenario. Suppose the bystanders at Pentecost were not even there. Suppose there had been no bystanders, there were no onlookers. Suppose the disciples had just basically spoken into thin air, you know what I mean? And there was no crowd to witness the strange phenomenon. Would the lack of an audience have invalidated the outpouring of the Holy Spirit no. and negated those messages in tongues? No, right? That's a rhetorical question and the answer again is a resounding no. So we're going to consider something uh, that's, that shows this is true. God, remember when God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the four winds and to scatter human bones? That's hardly a viable audience. Would you agree? Here, let me read this to you. This is from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 9 and 10. Then he, God, said unto me, Ezekiel, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. So, this proves that prophecies spoken into thin air, and even to a dead audience, are valid and effective, right? So, in fact, those who need the word of the Lord most are often those who understand it the least. So the word of the Lord does not depend on a receptive audience. Uh, not even an audience that has mental capacity, right? That's one of the reasons why Jesus cried in a loud voice to Lazarus, come out of the tomb. And he knew in advance that Lazarus would come out of the tomb. So in a sense, that was very a prophetic act. So the word of the Lord does not return void. It accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. Even so, prophecies do not have to be understood or favorably received, right? The whole, that's the whole point of prophecy. It makes a way where there is no natural way. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that shatters the rock in pieces? That's from Jeremiah 23, 29. So God releases his word whether or not people comprehend and comply. In fact, he releases his word because people do not comprehend and comply in order to make them comprehend and comply, right? This is the creative power of God's word at work. And given this principle, the legitimacy of corporate tongues, which are prophecy, is not contingent on human understanding and therefore not contingent on interpretation. You see the logical connection there? We also, also I wanna 
consider the disciples' point of view um, at Pentecost, God used them to break temple protocol. Have you ever thought about that? You know, uh, he moved upon them in such a way that they kind of commandeered what was happening in the temple in a way that was actually highly disruptive and for a purpose that was highly irregular according to temple protocol, right? And the disciples did not have any clue whether any of the thousands of onlookers um, understood even one word of what they were saying. And they also did not have an interpreter prepared, right? There was no interpreter there on standby waiting in the wings to interpret all of these different messages just in case the crowd would be baffled by the foreign garble. They had no interpreter uh, prepared. In fact, you could say that the disciples were not even concerned about what the crowd thought, at least not initially, right? They were busy enjoying God. And they were so busy enjoying God that they were accused of being drunk with wine, right? So you could say that they didn't really care too much about propriety and protocol. Um, by modern church service standards, their conduct violated, would have violated house rules for let all things be done decently and in order. Yeah? You agree? And I'm and I, sad to say their conduct probably would be banned in most churches today. But God arranged it, hey, and it pleased him, and we have to continue to do what pleases God, re regardless of religious sensibilities that want to straightjacket the spirit of God. All right, now let's look at another, amen, and let's look at another account. So that was Pentecost, now we're going to switch to the Gentiles when they got convert, converted and um, received the baptism. So a very similar um, event took place in the home of the Roman centurion Cornelius. He had gathered his extended family and friends into his home, and they were all listening to Peter share the gospel. But before Peter could finish, right, there was this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and then the Gentiles, or non-Jews, also got the gift of tongues. And this, of course, stunned the Jews who were present. Let me read to you. This is from Acts chapter 10, verses 45 and 46. Those of the circumcision, that's the Jews, were astonished because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So the Jews understood the gist of the message as magnification or verbal aggrandizement. And this they understood not because somebody interpreted. There was no interpreter at this event. It was because of the behavior of the individuals. The beha their behavior suggested praise, right? Their souls were enlarged by the object of their appreciation, right? God loomed large in their souls. And this is kind of the tenor of Mary's Magnificat when she learned that she was going to be carrying the Christ child in her womb. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord and extols him, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That's in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 and 47. So the, the nature of a magnificat or praise in tongues, you can be discerned by vocal quality and body language, right? The tone of voice, inflection, facial expressions, posture, gestures, movements, that kind of thing. They give clues. And praise is usually very enthusiastic or jubilant. So neither the speaker nor the listener may know exactly what the speaker is saying, but the speaker knows by how she feels, and the listener knows by how she's behaving that she is praising God, right? Um, and so this applies also, again, to corporate tongues that are a form of praise. There's an interesting verse in Psalm 8 that indicates something like this. It's not speaking directly about tongues, but kind of indirectly, and I'll, I'll make the logical link in a minute. Here it is, Psalm 8, verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Jesus actually quoted this verse, and he rendered it slightly differently. This is how he rendered it. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise to silence the enemy and the avenger. 
This is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 16. So Jesus equated nonsensical babble, the nonsensical babble of babies with praise. Okay? And when we extol God in tongues, we're a lot like babies. We're a lot like children, right? Our rational intellect is devoid of content, but our feeling capacity is fully alive. Yeah, and so those tongues are really powerful. They defeat the enemy. And what a humiliating defeat it is to be defeated by baby babble, right? By people who do not know what they are saying. Can you see the wisdom of God in that? And it's also poetic justice. Uh, God chooses the foolish things to confound the wise, doesn't he? I'm actually going to read a passage to you from one of the epistles of Paul. He makes no mention of tongues, but I really think that this passage could apply to tongues. So while I'm reciting it, think about tongues in the back of your mind and how it correlates with this passage. This is, I'm taking this from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 through 31. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God rendered foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its own wisdom did not know God, it pleased God to save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. For the Jews seek after a sign, and the Gentiles seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are being saved, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, and Christ, the wisdom of God. For you see my brother and my sisters, Brother Malcolm and my sisters here, that not many wise or mighty or noble, according to this world, were saved among you. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the mighty. He's chosen the things that are base and the things that are despised and the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are so that no flesh should glory in his presence. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So you see here... This passage is talking about God choosing the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And let's admit, tongues are foolish. And corporate tongues all the more so, right? But wisdom is proven right by her children. And if you look at Pentecost, how many people were converted on the day of Pentecost when tongues, corporate tongues was released? 3,000. 3,000 were brought into the fold as a direct consequence of corporate tongues. So, it pleased God to save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. That's a great application. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. And by the way, this is actually honoring a request of the Jews. The Jews request a sign. Actually, they don't just request a sign, they require a sign. They demand, they, look, they want to see signs and wonders as proof positive, right? And one of the signs that God has given them, and Gentiles, is tongues, right? These signs will follow those who believe in my name. They shall speak with new tongues. That's Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And the Lord authenticates and validates the preaching of the gospel with accompanying signs, one of which happens to be tongues, right? They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. That's Mark 16, 20. Amen. All right, we're going to move on a little bit to corporate singing in tongues. We just talked about corporate praise and corporate prophecy. Corporate singing in tongues. Man, this is a special and a beautiful form of improvisational worship. I love this, and I yearn for this, and I hope that we can get something going, something really vibrant and robust in this house. Um, singing in tongues with other believers apparently was an established practice in the New Testament church. And I, I derive that from a couple of verses. Paul instructs believers to sing spiritual songs to one another. Here's one verse. 
Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's songs in tongues. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. And here's another verse. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. So spiritual songs or songs in tongues are not just songs you sing solo in the shower. Yeah? They're not just songs you sing solo in the shower to yourself and to God. They are also songs that you sing with other believers and even to other believers. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in spiritual songs. Teaching and admonishing one another in spiritual songs. Right, that directive to sing to one another requires social interaction, right? It requires relational engagement in the context of fellowship. So this means that singing in tongues in church is or should be standard practice. Now what do these um, spiritual songs do? They impart grace and they also instruct and counsel. Let the word of Christ dwell in you in all, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in spiritual songs. Again, that was from Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Now, I don't know about you, but that almost seems odd, that you could teach someone or admonish someone by singing in mystery languages. Does that, doesn't that seem counterintuitive? But I think there is, um, there is divine logic in this, and that is the spirit of a person can learn before the mind does, right? The spirit of a person can learn, learn and be um, reproved independently of the mind, and the mind can catch up later. I sometimes think this is how children learn. You know, when, especially in, in their very formative years of development before their brain is mature, um, they get a lot of instructions, particularly from their parents. And they don't understand really what's going on, but they manage to navigate. And I think a lot of it has to do with their spirit catches on, and then the mind catches up later. Like when, when mama reproves the child and says, don't do that, child learns not to do that, and then two years later, oh, because it's unsafe, or because it's inappropriate, or because it irritates my neighbor, you know, whatever it might be. So this is amazing. I find this very, um, I find it amazing that we can be instructed through mystery languages sung to one another. I serenade you in a mystery language, and then suddenly you understand things that you didn't understand before. I think it's because the spirit of revelation is operating through the gift of tongues. So, practical application. Um, singing in tongues can be a standalone practice, right? It's self-contained, it's complete in and of itself. You don't have to add anything to it. But Paul recommends or exhorts believers to sing in tongues and then also sing with their natural understanding in their native language. What is the conclusion then, Paul asks? I will sing with the Spirit and I will also sing with the understanding. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15. And by the way, when you do that, when you alternate between singing in tongues and singing in English, singing in tongues and singing in English, most likely you're going to be activating the gift of interpretation. Sometimes what you sing in English is an interpretation of what you just sang in tongues. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that that happens after a while, and especially when you keep practicing. Now, there are lots of ways that we can incorporate singing in tongues into the assembly. Uh, the best one is when the Holy Spirit initiates. And this is, this is what happens when you've got spontaneous corporate worship in tongues occurring. Nobody, you know, nobody started it. It was just sort of like a move of the Spirit through God's people. But a human director can also lead that. And, and let me add this to it. The house has to be a house of freedom for that to even be possible. We agree? Um, there, the, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It has to be a house of liberty for the spirit to really move like that. And of course, with um, the corporate singing, you can, again, alternate between English and um, singing in tongues. You can sing in tongues the same melody that somebody else is singing in English. I do that a lot, actually. And you can also harmonize in tongues to a melody in English. 
And you can also sing in tongues a different but hopefully complementary melody to the one that's being sung in English. That's called counterpoint, I think. I'm not a musician. Um, and then you can also sing in tongues at different time intervals. I don't know that I've ever done that. Different time intervals, like in a canon or round. So these are just some examples. And this is likely to sound really complex, like layers of water folding in. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard this, but it, it, it is really neat. It's almost like a waterfall uh, sensation when you hear lots of people singing in tongues simultaneously. This hosts the presence of God really powerfully. Now, we admit that you know, singing in general is more compelling than speaking, right? It's more, it's more expressive, it's more impassioned, it's more lyrical, it's more rhythmic than speaking. But you add to that the fact that the Holy Spirit is composing the melody and also the lyrics, and it's very compelling. It can shift the atmosphere really fast, I think a lot faster than singing in English. And it creates this spiritual environment, like a, a Holy Ghost soundscape that really elevates the congregation spiritually and kind of unites people. And it also activates gifts of revelation and power. The best part about it, God is singing to us, through us. And there are a couple of verses in the Old Testament about what this is like. Here's one. This is from a psalm. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. That's uh, Psalm 32, verse 7. And here's another one. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty warrior who gives victory. He rejoices over you with gladness. He renews you in his love. He exults over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. That's in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Okay, I want to do a group activation. And let me share with you what inspired the topic. Uh, I was watching a Sid Roth interview of Perry Stone. This was about two years old. I think it was released in 2018. How many of you know who Perry Stone is? Or who doesn't? Does anybody not know who Perry? Malcolm, do you know who Perry Stone is? He is a prophetic teacher, a revelatory prophetic teacher in the body of Christ. And he deals a lot with end time prophecy, kind of a heavy revy guy, heavy revelation. And he also is very interested in the Jewish roots of our faith. So anyway, that's him. But he was making a comment. I don't know if it was kind of an offhanded comment. He said that his observation about a particular pattern, that there's a lot of spiritual warfare during election years, and a lot of witchcraft is released during election years, and we are in an election year, and I don't know about you, but I have felt a ramping up. I don't know if it's just because we've entered in a new decade, and it's a very significant decade. That could be the case as well. But um, I would love t for us to set our minds or our hearts on this topic that, um, that we prophesy in tongues over the United States of America. Basically to release and establish God's will. Not just in 2020, but moving on beyond that. So in other words, that God would orchestrate whatever needs to be orchestrated behind the scenes. Um, that the election results would be conducive to this nation fulfilling its God-given purpose. Um, that, that believers would really excel and prosper in their unique ministries. Amen, Tanya? <laughs> And that truth, righteousness, and justice, as God defines it, would prevail. And that unbelievers would experience a moral awakening, right? And spiritual realignment. So that's kind of all of what I was thinking of in terms of praying for God's will in the United States of America, prophesying it through tongues. Um, now we're going to do this for an extended period of time, maybe about five minutes, and I will stand here at the mic and do maybe about three minutes. Do I, would I have any volunteers to take over 30 seconds or a minute? Okay, Nikki is willing to do. Anybody else who's bold enough to come here? So maybe the last couple of minutes. Is that good? You want to do yeah, the last well, however couple of minutes? Yeah, however you want to, whatever you want to do. Okay, good. Right, do you so, want me to sing it or to speak it or what? Um, well, you could do either, however, however you feel led, right? Because we covered singing in tongues, too, so if you feel led to sing, 
That would be awesome. We'll just see what the spirit does. Yeah, yeah. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to stand, and we're going to do this for five minutes. And if you speak in more than one tongue, alternate. Also, monitor yourself, okay? Um, take mental note of any impressions that you get, because I would love to get a few volunteers afterward to come up and share impressions. And we're not going to share impressions about names of candidates and their platforms, right. but just basically the... Um, the spiritual trajectory of this nation, God's purpose for this nation, that, those kinds of things. So notice if you have any physical sensations, if you have any emotions that rise up, if you get any scriptures, if you have any visual impressions, whatever it may be, and you can either try to remember those mentally or write them down. And if you want to afterward, I'll call up some volunteers. All right, do we know what we're doing? <laughs> you want okay. to, yeah, we're, yeah, we're doing baby babble. We're seeing like yeah, baby babble. It's okay. Any kind of baby babble. I'm going to actually tr turn the timer. Doesn't this normally involve spiritual warfare? Yeah. Yeah, this, this, um, you're talking about election year yeah. involving spiritual no, warfare? No, when you're speaking in tongues for the reasons that you just yeah yeah so maybe if you want to if you warfare. want to chant or if you want so to you do the rapid machine gun fire uh -oh. tongues so or everybody what? stay clear of malcolm because he's oh. hot tonight <laughs> <laughs> well we welcome it yeah actually that's a very good point ray so yeah given the topic we can anticipate or we should probably psych ourselves up for some very vigorous militant decrees yeah. in tongues, okay? Does that sound right? Why don't we stand? It's a lot easier to um, be militant when you're standing. <laughs> and probably at about the three minute mark, we'll call you up and you can okay. do the other two minutes uh -huh. in the tongues. Okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Bajamba, <laughs> 
I'm making a wave. I'm making a wave across this nation. I'm making a mighty wave across this nation. And I see the way you show when you're measuring how an earthquake sends the waves, like when they do the tanks and they show how the water moves during an earthquake and how they measure the height of the wave. I just see that. The Lord's doing it across this nation. Lord, thank you for whatever that entails in this wave you're making across our nation. We thank you for that, God, because we know it comes from our Heavenly Father. It's a mighty wave, and it comes from you, God. 
And that wave does mighty things, God. We trust and know that there's power in it, and it has a purpose. It is going to serve a purpose, says God. It's going to serve a purpose. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I touch and agree. I touch and agree. Anybody else get an impression you want to share? Come on, Ray. I had an image. All right, tell us your image. Oh, wow, everybody was speaking in tongues and unism. I could just see an image it was like an army as wide as you can see. I could not see an end to the left, and to the right, and to the east, and to the west. I could not see an end. And if you can just imagine what it must sound like if you were to have an army descending on Washington or wherever they are headed, and there's millions and millions of them stomping of their feet while they're marching. I mean, it's, they're not trying to make a noise. It's just there's millions of them. And the fear that that could project out to the adversary or the enemy to send them fleeing, which is what we're trying to do, to send them fleeing. But, you know, as we're seeing, as I'm seeing, all these heads, as far as you could see, overhead it was dark and stormy. But you could see behind the clouds it was bright. So it was like behind the army it was bright, but over the army it was stormy. And it was, I mean, just the heavens were just raging and wide open and lightning and just thunder and clapping and just as this army moved forward, which just shows that there's brighter days behind what's getting ready to come, but it wasn't anything I was afraid of. I was like, I'm one of those persons. Yeah. <laughs> I'm that front row. <laughs> so, wow, that is and the more, cool. and as your voices rose up, the sound of the <laughs> footsteps got louder and louder and louder. That's good. Uh, when you kind of die down, the footsteps kind of die down. Oh, too. that's a, so you got to keep oh, yeah. you got to keep praying and speaking. Anyone else? Another an impression? Anyone else? Come on, excellent, excellent. Well, very simple. But I just the thoughts that came to me were silencing the enemy and bringing confusion into the camp, the enemy's camp. Let's repeat it one more time. Bringing, uh, silencing the enemy and bringing confusion into the enemy's camp. Amen. 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 Silencing, silencing the enemy and bringing confusion into the enemy's camp. Very interesting because I got, uh, be still and know that I am God. Other translations say, cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. Um, I believe that this whole psalm is relevant, so I want to read it to you. This is Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be cast into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and are troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. Does that not sound like the river of living water, the rivers of living water that are flowing out of our hearts, my friends? There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. The Lord uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. 
The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow. He cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Mm -hmm. Selah. Amen. Yeah. That's what we need. Lord, we just, even by declaring that and everything that we've declared, we just thank you that you are releasing angels yes, to God. enforce the word. Yes. They are the servants to the heirs of salvation. They are the ones who enforce your word. And we thank you that even when we speak it, God, um, they are following. Hey, did you get something? Come on up, Tanya. When we started to pray, I heard the word justice. And uh, it was like at first, like if I didn't have breath. And then the more, and then even towards the end, I had even more breath. And I just felt like um, God wants to um, bring justice to certain people groups. And uh, God wants to bring justice to women Amen. in office and also in society that have been abused, that have been torn down. And then towards the end when we were doing the, the meditation or the, um, it's like I, I just, I saw myself just kind of like being bowed down like this. And then it was just like slowly, and then towards the end just kind of straightening up and rising up. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a bow down and then a rising up. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I felt. Hallelujah. Thank you for sharing, Tanya. Wow. Last call. Anybody else? Oh, excellent. Come up, Malcolm. Isaiah 11, 4. Go, go ahead and adjust the microphone. There you go, sweetheart. With righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Wait, read it one more time. And that was Isaiah what? Chapter 11, verse 4. Okay. And, uh, five. Go ahead and read it again. That was great. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. That is profound. Yeah. And I think in all the all the impressions weave together so powerfully. I'm going to look forward to um, reviewing this yeah. video whenever it's posted. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Do you have something to share, honey? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next time we're gonna we're gonna throw that last suit out sometime and reel you up here, but we'll wait. All right, that's it. We're done for today. Thank you.